Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here on the last day of our REA conference. Um, I think we're all troopers for hanging in there. Um, it's always hard to be online for um, such a long time, but um, it, it's wonderful that um, you've made it to this session. Um, I'm very excited about um, the scholarship that is going to be presented um, at this hour. And um, and some some um, hoping for some some very enriching dialogue um, uh, once the presenters have presented. So, I'd like to um, make this time as engaging as possible. Um, so, I, I want to talk a little bit about the flow um, before I present um, the 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 present the uh, do an introduction for the presenters. So. Um, what I'm um, suggesting is that the presenters um, each have about 15 minutes to um, offer a summary of their of their work um, or read their their essays, how, however they prefer. And then um, we have about 10 minutes to engage the presenter um, in in question with questions or dialogue, comments, thoughts, um, things that that resonate with you, um, points of connection. Um, with uh, the work that they're presenting. Um, and then I will, um, I'll, I'll do that for each of the presenters. And then I'd like some time for us to just have an open conversation about, um, you know, what, what kinds of uh, ideas and, and thoughts kind of uh, emerge from, from uh, just listening to each other um, and, and talking to each other. So um, if that's okay with you, I'll go ahead and um, present our, our first um, our first panelist, uh, this, uh, I'm very excited. Uh, she is a, a peer, um, a fellow student at Garrett um, Evangelical Theological Seminary. Um, Dr. Gina A.S. Robinson is a native of Georgia and currently works at the Wabash Center for Teaching and Learning and Theology and Religion as the Associate Director. She um, graduated from Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary in 2023. So re recent grad, yay! It gives me hope that I will finish soon as well. <laughs> um, and uh, she has a doctorate in uh, philosophy, uh, doctorate in philosophy in Christian education and congregational studies. Thank you, Gina. We look forward to hearing uh, from you. Greetings, everyone. It's so good to be with each and every one of you. Um, I have the opportunity to present briefly on uh, the subject in which I entitled my paper, Educating Black Girls Enduring Microaggressions in an Oreo World. When reading the call for papers, the question that jumped out at me was, whose children are they? In a world where belonging is a cornerstone principle and value, an embodied and lived out ethic, the answer might be, they are all our children. This possibility is merely aspirational. Reality holds different in the lived experiences of suburban Black Christian girls enduring microaggressions in an Oriole world. It is evidenced through interviews I conducted for my dissertation research that Black girls living in an Oriole world can be marginalized and treated differently than non-Black children, particularly by non-Black adults. The context in which they routinely experienced the most marginalization was K through 12 public school education. The people whose actions, behaviors, and words communicated they are not our children were their white teachers. As a woman, a scholar, practitioner, called to curate communal, educational, and ecclesial spaces that center the cultivation of child well being, it is important for me to explore and learn about the spaces youth inhabit that do not center their well being. What dynamics shape these environments? What is being taught implicitly and explicitly in these spaces? How do these learnings and messages impact the personal identity, racial identity, and spiritual formation of Black adolescent girls? Exploring the makeup, design, and function of suburban public schools helped me as a former youth minister think constructively about how to better educate Black girls enduring microaggressions. 
In this presentation, I will briefly highlight some curiosities, learnings, and points for further imagination from my exploration on why experiences of microaggressions in high schools necessitate a reimagining of the sanctuary as a site of religious education and formation for suburban Black Christian girls. So it might be helpful for me to, to define two terms before progressing in this presentation. The first one is microaggressions. Daryl Wing Su et al. argue racial microaggressions are brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, and environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults toward people of color. Suburban Black Christian girls live at an intersection of race, gender, sexuality, class, et cetera. And at this convergence, I believe this definition can still apply as it relates to the microaggressions they experience. It just applies in a more nuanced way. Oreo world. Oreo world is a concept I ground in my dissertation and continue to explore through my research. Oreo is a colloquialism used to describe the disposition of a certain group of Black people who are perceived as Black on the outside, but are white on the inside. According to dictionary.com, an Oreo is a Black person who is regarded as having adopted the attitudes, values, and behaviors thought to be characteristic of middle-class white society, often at the expense of their own heritage. This term is usually used or generally used in a derogatory manner when one assumes the Black person is approximating towards whiteness to fit into a world that does not equally include their Black identity. The reality is there are Black people living in white middle-class neighborhoods who must find ways to navigate being Black inside and out in the context of a predominantly white environment. Therefore, I subversively use the term Oreo in the concept of Oreo world to center Black lived experiences in the context of predominantly white environments. So first, let's look at the context of suburban schools. Schools are the context in which girls spend the majority of their time. R.L. Hero Lewis McCoy proposes, if asked to imagine suburban schools, a well-appointed classroom, engaged teaching with mostly white, well-behaved children come to mind. Suburban education has become regarded as the ideal. As the landscape of suburbs changed over the last 40 years, so did the education structure, political dominance, and social influence of the schools. Suburban schools took the image of boutiques that were customizable and attentive to the needs of students who migrated to their attachment areas. In, the, in this way, suburban schools held the special responsibility of passing on the rewards of achieving the American dream to the children of suburbia. Assumptions that buttress ideas regarding the success of suburban schools are, one, school funding and state local tax revenues. Two, population homogeneity. The school will reflect the racial and economic homogeneity of the suburb. And three, neighborhood schools. The school is comprised of students from families that live next to one another. What we know to be true is that the racial population is not homogenous in these suburbs and in these suburban schools. The dynamics of power, race, and socioeconomic class play out on all levels of hierarchical educational structures within two types of prevalent suburban schools one being majority minority suburban schools and one being exclusive enclaves. So majority minority schools is a common type of suburb and suburban school in which the demographics swing from majority white people to a majority people of color. According to Lewis McCoy, these districts are susceptible to a racial and class mis mismatch between those who govern and those who attend school. A problem that occurs with a lack of diversity at this level is an inattention to the residents' needs, which can lead to patterns of alienation and educational exploitation in school systems that were formerly regarding, regarded as high-performing. 
issues also occur at the curricular level. <clears throat> Anne, who is one of the young women whose story I will share in this presentation, attends a majority minority school. The second type of school is exclusive enclave, which is comprised largely of white populations with select number of minorities. Lewis McCoy argues the experiences of children in these schools are often considered better due to their exposure to school-related resources rooted in strong tax bases, which translate to high, higher, pupil, higher per pupil expenditures and more qualified teachers. Even though, even though the girls in this study live in the middle to upper uh, live in middle to upper middle class households, the stratification of wealth among their white peers places them in the racial and economic minority. Black children do not receive the same opportunities, um, nor the same treatment as their white peers due to bias, whether it's ageism, racism, or classism, just to name a few. These factors directly impact the culture and climate of the classroom and the learning experiences in this space. Unchecked notions of superiority can even permeate curriculum and curricular decisions. For example, tracking is a method used by secondary schools to group students according to perceived ability. For example, um, they'll think about their IQ or even their achievement levels. As a result, gifted and talented programs continue to enroll a disproportionate number of white and Asian students while excluding Black and Latino students. There are disparities in referrals for advanced placement courses and special education as well. Classroom culture and curricular decisions informed by bias determines the climate of the learning environment by reinforcing superior notions of whiteness, gender discrimination, and socioeconomic stereotypes. Unfortunately, the girls I interviewed were educated in biased classrooms and endured microaggression encounters with their peers. I will now share some of Anne's stories. So Anne, at the time I interviewed her, was a sophomore in high school. And she, as I said, it attended a majority minority school. And she was also a student who endured physical health um, issues and ailments. So because of her physical health issues and ailments, her mom took the steps necessary to get a 504 plan in place, which is a plan um, that ensures accommodations are and support is set out for her and for her education so that she can be successful in her learning. So Anne had her 504 plan. Her teachers were aware of what the plan was. Um, However, she still experienced academic injustice from her teachers, particularly in her English and math classes. So Anne, who again was a very bright young woman who was on the honor roll before she had her first surgery due to her physical health ailment, she was, after returning to school, placed in additional courses. Instead of the teachers um, helping her to catch up on her work or seeing that her um, missing her work was due to her health issues, they saw it, particularly the teacher who was her, her English teacher, even made comments to say, oh, I thought you were just slacking off because she didn't turn work in. So with these sorts of comments, herein lies the microaggression. And not only was it just a microaggression in the words that were spoken to her, it was also a microaggression within the fact that she was placed in additional courses because her grades failed due to her not turning in the work, which she was unable to do because she was unwell. Mind you, this is a young woman who is quite literate, so literate that she scored 80 points higher than the average student in her school on the standardized English test. Yet the teacher decided to put her in a literacy class, which is designed for students who do not read well. So she has to take on more um, because this teacher was unable to see her in the fullness of who she is. And due to these microaggressions, um, Anne began to, to feel the impact of them. They had an impact on her such that she 
so angry um, and rightfully so, but she never acted out of her anger. In one of the incidents in which she had to read out loud in the literacy class, they were reading a book that had the N-word epithet in it multiple times. She was called on to read and she told her teacher she didn't want to read. But the teacher said, oh no, it's okay, it's just a word. And then repeated to say it multiple times in front of black and brown children. This was a white teacher. Um, So in that moment of feeling anger, Anne knew She could at least tell the teacher, I don't want to say it, please call on someone else. But she couldn't respond in the way in which she wanted to, which was to tell the teacher, inform the teacher, it's inappropriate for you to be saying this word in 2023. Um, Because she feared the retaliation, which happens against many Black girls in school, which can be excessive punishment or stereotyped treatment. So for a lot of these young girls who experience these microaggressions in schools in which they have majority teachers who are white um, and sometimes few peers who look like them, they come into this place of um, dilemma. They can have a dilemma such that it is one where they have um, a psychological dilemma. What do I do? Or maybe let me minimize it and say it didn't happen so that my emotions are a little um, more managed, right? So there's one way in which they try to manage it by minimizing the experience that they know they just had. So psychologically, they'll minimize. They may even question, did this happen? And they know they just had that experience. So after doing the research on what are microaggressions, how they function, I had questions about their spirituality. What is the spiritual impact? So not only did it have an impact on the psyche, it has an impact on the spirit, on the mind, on the body. And for Anne, her impact was really related to um, how to further endure in the midst of her own physical health, um, the emotional labor that was placed upon her by this teacher and her learning environment. Right. So she's there to learn, but there's so many other things that she was navigating just to get her K through 12 education. So entered in youth pastor at the time, Gina. This is how the research found me. We were inside our sanctuary having our youth Sunday service, um, in which the liturgy was pretty basic, um, in which we would have a welcome, prayer, announcements, a birthday shout out, sermon, sermon talk back. But in the midst of that, sandwiched in between was a check-in time. And it was during this check-in time in which I learned about the microaggression experiences. Um, And at the time, I felt as if I was not adequately prepared on how to give them um, advice on how to respond. Because they're not only asking, um, what should I do? They're asking the question of what does God believe I should do, right? So this really became a theological quest and question for them in the ways in which God was showing up in their Oreo world. Um, And at the time, I didn't have, I felt like I didn't have enough, right? And I would often feel like, do I stay in this conversation of what they're experiencing or do I move on? to the sermon. So that's when I mentioned, when I leaned into this space of reimagination. Um, And the way in which I did that was by joining in conversation with six young girls, including Anne, who is a pseudonym that I'm using, um, to learn about what is it that you need from another space in which you find safe, um, that being the church. So for them, the school was an unsafe space, an unsafe learning environment, But the church was a learning environment that was safe enough that they felt they could practice vulnerability and say, this is what I'm experiencing. This is what I'm enduring. What do I do? How do I respond? How do I feel? Are my feelings valid? How does God see me? And how ought I see God acting in the world? So that brought about a dissertation. And now on the other side of it, Um, In being in conversation with them, I have learned that what they really wanted and needed in that moment was not the sermon from the youth pastor, but more time to be in conversation with their peers 
who had also had similar experiences so that they could learn from one another. And they also would have appreciated me chiming in to say, I've been there. My world looked different when I was 16, but these are some of the ways in which I navigated. So in thinking about reimaginations of what we can do in these experiences of marginalization, I um, created a small method and it's related to my methodology on um, in which I use for my interviews for my dissertation where I center mindfulness and I invite, in people, invite everyone into a mindfulness space such that they're comfortable and feel okay and have something to go back to in those moments that are hard in which they're talking about the microaggression they've experienced. So then they can engage in the practice of testimony, right? And in this practice of testimony, they talk about what they've been through and they can also talk about um, how they felt, what they wanted to do, what they did not do, and the ways in which they were able to see spirit acting um, in the midst of it, or ways in which they wish they saw spirit acting. And after they have that testimonial moment, then it opens a space for communal care, where the other young people who are in the room, other adults who, in which the young women said they wanted to invite more um, generations of Black women into the room to hear about these experiences, to learn from that lived experience, so that then they can know how to endure microaggressions in this society um, in which they are growing up in, particularly as they are um, navigating the waters of education. So ultimately, I believe religious education has some things to say to the world of education um, broadly, um, particularly about formation and development of youth. And I believe that there is space and room for a conversation so that we can hopefully um, combat and come against some of the marginalization and discrimination that they are experiencing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson, for an excellent presentation. Um, I want to open up the space now for um, thoughts, um, points of connection, questions you may want to ask about um, what was presented. Would anybody like to start us off? I have a question, um, Dr. Robinson. Uh, thank you so much for um, such a uh, provocative uh, and necessary uh, explanation as to what and how to deal with marginalized youth. Um, I kept in my mind thinking about my young people um, at my church that I serve. And I was thinking like, one of the, what were some of the things um, that you use to start that conversation? Um, what are some of the strategies you, you, that you suggest to, to start that conversation? Of course, you know, young people feel for the most part safe at church, um, but you know, there's oftentimes like some kind of, um, there's some kind of um, uh, probing uh, tool that is used to get them to start talking about those things. So um, like, how do you set that stage for that vulnerability to be then uh, explicated? In Thank you so much for your question, Andre. Um, for me, I came in um, as truly an outsider into this space. I worked at an African Methodist Episcopal church. I am very much so Baptist, um, though I tend to find myself in Methodist spaces, which is a whole nother conversation, and it has been great for me. But in that, I named who I was, how I was coming from the outside in, and that I was bringing really little to no knowledge. I'm here to learn and I'm here to grow with you. Um, so in so doing on our first day, I set the atmosphere of we don't have any rules. We're not gonna function with rules. I'm not gonna enforce any rules, but maybe it will help us to come up with some communal agreements. And in those communal agreements, we talked about um, how we will communicate with one another. And I share with them, I hope there comes a day in which you all feel comfortable enough to be vulnerable in this space. I know I am new to you, you all know each other, but I hope that through my presence and through me showing up consistently, you will then begin to um, build some trust with me. So 
that was kind of the foundation that I set for conversation. Now, the questions that I asked to probe were the same two questions every week. How are you? How was your week? And it started out, I'm good. My week was fine. A few months later, they began to say and share more. As one demonstrated vulnerability, another would demonstrate vulnerability. So it would go from, I'm good, my week was fine, to I'm good. This week, I went to uh, cheerleading tryouts. Really? How were your cheerleading tryouts? How did that go for you? When did you start cheerleading? So then I demonstrate interest in their life. And as I do that, they established even more trust with me. So it got to a point when I asked the same question one day, how are you? How was your week? Someone told me about a microaggression experience they had. And I, was, I wasn't shocked, but I didn't know that was coming, right? So in asking those simple questions, anything can come up. It really does open the door for them to share what they're experiencing and what's on their heart. But I realized I wasn't as ready as I thought I was for um, that sort of question. So that became a point of learning for me. Thank you very much. Um, Chuck, you had your hand up earlier. Do you have a question you want to ask? Uh, no, I just I want to thank um, Dr. Robinson for her paper. I put in the chat the book, The Hate You Give. Um, the Hate You Give really covers what you're talking about in your paper. I do recommend that uh, book if people want to read a novel based on that. I, I was I taught in a in a high school, Catholic high school for 24 years, all boys. But a lot of the things you mentioned obviously apply to a male setting as well, predominantly African-American, Hispanic school. Um, and I, what also came to mind is the Jack and Jill programs. Are you familiar with the Jack and Jill programs? Because I wonder, I wonder what the Jack and Jill programs um, have to contribute. And, and I also wonder, I know, you, I think you did primarily public schools. I wonder what you would have found, uh, probably similar, very similar, if you would have gone into Catholic suburban schools in, or even in, in the urban areas of Chicago, Catholic urban schools. Uh, and again, we're dealing with male-female issues. Mine was an all-male setting, but um, I'll put a link to the Jack and Jill schools, and uh, that's just another question I raise. Yeah, thank you so much, Chuck, for lifting up the book, The Hate You Give. I actually used that book um, in my dissertation, and I look at the character of Star as an example of a young woman who is in a fictitious book, but her experiences are very real, right? So um, within the Black community, we recognize that these experiences are so real to the point that we can write a fictitious story about it and still have a connection to it and say, I've been there, I've been through that. And as it relates to Jack and Jill, that is actually a social club that I do look at that helps to round out the Oreo world. Um, and I had a young woman who I interviewed who was in Jack and Jill, and she talked about some of her experiences in there. So it'll be interesting um, to see what people's thoughts are about these historically Black social clubs that were designed for the upliftment of Black people um, and how in these spaces there can also be moments of microaggression that happen differently. So thank you so much for your, your thoughts there. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more. We got about an another minute. Um, uh, maybe Norma, um, Paulus, I see you. We'll have some time after at the end of all the presentations to also just have an open discussion about everything that's presented. Um, if that's okay with you, Paulus, we can um, we, we can do that at the end. Um, Norma, I have you next, um, your hand raised next. Would you like to ask your question? Very briefly, I'd like to, thank you so much. I'd like to ask you about the intersectionality of class, race, gender, health, disability. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, of, of black girls in terms of um, gender issues in terms of black boys. And I'm thinking of a white girl uh, who uh, has just entered college and every time students go home for a break, she has to go to the hospital. And even the white teachers think they understand disability and have no idea. And also the issue of class and how that interacts uh, with expectation uh, 
Spanish, Hispanics, Black, and so on. So just a, a word about the intersectionality, which calls forth even more listening. Yes, thank you so much for um, taking the conversation in the direction of intersectionality, because it is impossible to understand the fullness of the experiences of these young women, or even of the um, young white woman who, who you mentioned who has a health challenge, um, who, whose experience is then differed and nuanced in ways that is difficult or can be difficult for people to understand when they don't listen, um, which for me, I wonder if they care, right? Do you care to listen? Do you care to hear? Um, because it is possible, right? And I believe listening is the way in to really see what is happening at the intersection of the lived experience of people who are often marginalized for whatever reason. Um, just to think a little bit about the interplay of class and gender and race in these suburban, suburban spaces, um, for the young women I interviewed, as I mentioned, they were all either middle to upper middle class. I mean, one young woman's father is a doctor, um, one young woman lived in a household. Some of them disclosed to me what their household income was. It was well over $200,000. But when they walk into these spaces and in these classrooms, they are not seen as people of means. Um, they are viewed based on their skin tone and judged um, and stereotyped based on what teachers have possibly learned throughout their education. Um, so one thing that I learned in my studies is that there's a lot of information on like underachievement of black students and a lot of research on the underachievement. Um, but what about those who actually do well? Yeah. So when a teacher is in teacher's college or is in school, or they're looking up an article on how do I learn more about black students? How do I learn more about black girls? What literature is out there? It's not literature that's showing how these are well-rounded, bright, and brilliant people if you're able to see it and bring it out and connect to it. Um, so that's my approach in which I choose. And I hope through my work, I'm able to lift up um, those aspects of being and humanity within not only young Black girls, but all young people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Robinson, for your wonderful scholarship. And um, thank you, everyone, for your um, engagement with the presenter. I'd like to move on to our next presenter and also remind you that um, those who have questions for Dr. Robinson, please put those in the chat. We can get to them at the end of the presentation so you don't forget them. <laughs> um, our next presenter, um, give me one second, um, is Unjin John who's a doctoral student in uh, the joint doctoral program at the University of Denver and the Islip School of Theology. Um, her research focuses on the religious identity formation among young Asian women with a special emphasis on embodied pedagogies, critical theory, popular culture, and transnational feminist theology. Thank you for your time. We can't wait to hear from you. Good morning and good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to have opportunity to share my emerging and exciting research title, Transformative Spiritual Practice Towards Resisting the Communification of the Asian Girls' Bodies in K-Pop Cultures. The paper is divided into the three sections, the context, the miseducation of the Asian girls' body image in K-Pop cultures, second, the theological interpretations Asian girl's body as a sacred mom. Third, pedagogical implications from the Talchum. In this section, I examine three stages of the Talchum's play, critical consciousness, a liberative mask dance, a mask dance with spirit. K-pop, the captivating the genre of the popular music originating from South Korea, has transcended borders to become a global cultural phenomenon. 
It's a widespread popularity in South Korea since, in, since the 1990s coincide with a period of the profound social transformation characterized by democratic mobilization, the rise of the neoliberal ideologies and rapid industrial development. Within this the cultural landscape, K-pop cultures emerged as a popular medium through the which the younger generation could express their longing for cultural diversity, seek out novel experiences, and break free from the political oppression. The youth becoming significant influencers in popular cultures play the crucial role in shaping K-pop into a manifestation of the neoliberalism. As you can see in these pictures, the K-pop idols fandom phenomenon has been increasing around the world, including the Europe, the United States, Indonesia, India, and so on. The incredibly proliferation of the K-pop cultures and its mass massive global fan, fan base can largely be attributed to the forces of the global consumerism, cultural imperialism, particularly originated from the United States. Since importing the US cultures with financial assistance in 1997, Korean musicians in the entertainment industry have started incorporating Western pop music and entertainment practice into their artistic repertoire of the K-pop cultures. Nowadays, K-pop culture has become a global cultures. Within the context of the K-pop, K-popular cultures expanding into a global phenomenon, I contemplate the central question of the, this annual REA theme, whose children are they? My focus is directed toward children and young adults immersed in K-pop cultures. In attempting to address this question, I have identified two focus groups heavily influenced by K-pop cultures. First, Asian girls who not only seek to emulate the body image portrayed by K-pop female idols, but also actively reflect their own body image based on their idols. Second, the global fans, particularly girls who are captivated by K-pop female idols' body image. As you can observe from the pictures on the PowerPoint, the body image portrayed is predominantly white, sexy, pretty, and thin. These images of the Asian female idols in K-pop cultures reflecting a standard based on the Caucasian features, thus becoming a representative body image imposed on all Asian girls. However, it's important to note that this commodified body image of the K-pop idols does not precisely represent the diverse range of the body types and images among Asian girls. Despite the commodified body image of the K-pop idols, the entertainment industry is often viewed as a source of the empowerment for Asian girls who aim to enhance their self-esteem and assert their agency through their bodies. It's true that for some Asian girls aspiring to become celebrities like K-pop idols or beauty pageant winners or spa models, the training system providing an avenue to assert their agency, boost their self-esteem, and pursue their ambitions. While this argument holds some varieties, it fails to address the variety of the body types and image present among Asian girls. Critical socialist educator Henry Jules argues that in beauty pageant, the notion of the self-esteem involves accepting rather than critically questioning a gender code that rewards young girls for the, their appearance, submissiveness, and sex appeal. Consequently, self-esteem often becomes a euphemism for self hatred reinforcing rigid gender roles and a sense of the powerlessness. This perpetuates the commodification, objectification, and perishization of the girls' bodies. As a result, the commodified body image of the K-pop idol girls 
portrayed through social media has a detrimental effect on the identity formation of the Asian girls, especially those who aspire to resemble K-pop idol females. This influence extends to global fandoms that perceive Asian bodies essentially through the commodified, objectified, and fascinated the portrayal of the K-pop girls within the global consumer cultures. Moreover, patriarchal gender hierarchies prevalent in Korean society and certain Asian societies contribute to the miseducation of the Asian girls and global fans around the world. Here, I argue that as a religious educator and practical theologian, I argue that the body is not a commodified, objectified, and subordinated one, but rather a sacred space where individuals can encounter God, themselves, and others. Through this encounter, they can embrace their unique beauty as a reflection of the image of God. Indeed, as embodied creatures, Asian girls' identity formation and transformation are deeply intertwined with the ways in which we communicate and experience the world through our bodies. By recognizing the inherent dignity of the, their bodies and honoring them accordingly, Asian girls can cultivate on an integrated spirituality that embraces a holistic understanding of the, their bodies as a vital component in their spiritual journey of the self-discovery and connections with God, self, and others. In this context, I engage with the Hyung Chung's theology of the moon. The moon refers to the physical forms in Korean derived from the concept of the gathers at, as a, the mo uda. Hyung argues for the recognition of the inherent holiness and beauty in all bodies, regardless of the color, gender, physical ability, age, fertility, sexual orientation sexual history or material status. These perspectives empathize the sacredness and beauty inherent in all bodies. Furthermore, a theology of the moon affirms the beauty of the bodies beyond the constraints of the cultural standards at any given time. Building upon this, upon this argument, I propose that the body of the Asian girl as well as that of the global girls aspiring to emulate the commodified K-pop girls' body image can be regarded as a sacred and theological space. It's a within this space that discussion about God can be explored and individuals can embrace their bodies themselves, disregarding cultural standards or physical attributes. Here, for discovering their body as a sacred place and sacred moon, I examine that dance serves as a metaphor for resilient spirituality that enables girls and women to resist toxic social constructions and fragmented spirituality in religious education. Dance serves as a pedagogical metaphor through which girls can explore the significance of their moon as a sacred space wherein their spirit can free rolling reside. It allows them to express their sense of the liberation and freedom while nurturing their spirituality within the K-pop cultures, which is characterized by the pervasive influence of, of distorted body image standards imposed upon K-pop girls' idols. Building on this theoretical and practical understanding of dance as a practical tool, I propose metaphor of the Tarchum, a Korean traditional mask dance as a transformative spiritual practice. Tarchum is a traditional Korean art form that combines dance, music, and theater with mask. I propose that Tarchum metaphor can serve as a transformative pedagogical practice for Asian girls and youth influenced by the distorted body image in K-pop cultures. Tarchum metaphor can enable these girls to un understand the sanctity of their bodies and embark on a journey of the self-discovery. As a pedagogical implication of the Tarchum, 
I illuminate three practical stages of the Taltung place that provide valuable insight into the spiritual formation of girls. In the Taltung play, they begin by employing a critical lens to, to tackle social, political, and religious issues. And then they subsequently engage in the mass Taltung performance. It's art and a communal play, and then the finishing the after the mask dance. During the, this process of the Taichung play, three stages, I examine the pedagogical practice, which are the three stages of the Taichung, critical consciousness, a liberative mask dance, and a mask dance with spirit. First, the critical consciousness stage. As a Tarchum serves as a platform for raising awareness and cultivating a critical understanding of the prevalent inequalities and injustice pervasive in society, it's a crucial to promote the social consciousness regarding K-pop cultures, which reinforces the misrepresentation of the commodified Asian girl's body image. Instead of dismissing K-pop culture as a harmless or unrelated to spirituality, the religious community should actively engage in the critical analysis of the depiction of the Asian girls' bodies based on the pervasive Caucasian standards of the beauty in K-pop culture. This engagement will assist in recognizing the detrimental influence on the, their spirituality. In this process, I suggest that the religious communities, parents, and peer groups play a crucial role in nurturing critical awareness as a means to counteract the detrimental effect of the K-pop cultures on the perception of the Asian girls regarding their bodies as a sacred entities and their body images. The cultivation of the critical consciousness concerning their bodies as a sacred mom signifies the initial step towards engaging in a reflective process. The second stage, I suggest a, a liberative mask dance. Tarchum serves as a communal form of the expression, providing individuals with a platform to voice their suppressed emotion in the face of the oppressive conditions. Through Tarchum, Asian girls are able to challenge societal beauty norms prevalent in K-pop cultures and view their bodies as a means of the resistance, fostering a transformative and liberative spiritual practice. Particularly, donning masks serve as a pedagogical metaphor for Asian girls to freely express themselves, explore their authentic identities, and engaging in the dialogue with their bodies and spirituality. By concealing their faces, they can transcend the fear of the judgment influenced by societal expectations, the fetishization of the Asian female bodies, sexism, racism, and assumption about appearance and body image, allowing for greater self-exploration and empowerment. One example of the liberative mask dance in the practical way is Middle Release Monday. The Middle East Monday is a practice that embody, embodies the principles of the liberative mask dance. Middle East Monday is the practice and is a, uh, where the participants purposely refrain from the using mirrors for a day to challenge societal norms of the appearance and beauty. By a letting go of the middle real lines, individuals engage in introspection and reevaluate their self-perception, shifting attention away from the conforming to Caucasian beauty standards prevalent in K-pop cultures. This practice fosters a deeper connection with God, self, and others. Finally, the moving on to the third stage, a mass dance with spirit. The mask dance with spirit holds a profound significance as an act of the resistance, empowering Asian girls to embrace their beauty as a reflection of the God's image. This transformative process allows them to assert their agency in their everyday lives and serves as an inspiration for others who may struggle with body image issues or blindly emulate the K-pop idols without critical awareness. Through 
their courageous journey, Asian girls embraced the risk associated with embracing their authentic selves, creating a space of freedom, confidence, and empowerment to defy societal pressures. Ultimately, the unmasked dance with spirit becomes an invitation to cultivate a powerful affirmation of the inherent indignity and beauty within all individuals, transcending the confines of the commodification, sacrifice, and objectification of their bodies. By doing so, they can seek their integrity, spirituality, and embrace their bodies as a sacred moon, ultimately carving out a space of the freedom and empowerment for themselves. It's a never-ending process of the transformation until everyone is dancing together. Talchum. I hope the religious education should throw a Talchum dance party to make it happen together. Thank you. Thank you so much, An Jin, for your presentation. Uh, wonderful, wonderful job. Um, I'd like to open up the space again for those who have comments or points of connection that they'd like to share with our presenter. You can also put um, comments in the chat. Thank you so much for lifting up the importance of dance um, and putting that juxtaposed to um, the, the music and dance industry of K-pop and helping us to see, um, you know, the difference between uh, what a, a transformative, empowering kind of dance um, can mean for young women. Any thoughts? Yes, Paulos. Okay, thank you. Uh, I appreciate with uh, your presentation. Uh, so so nice and grateful to listen it. And my question is, uh, you combine two two kind of models of religious education, uh, from religious education and from uh, culture education. Uh, my question is, uh, what methodology when you meet to uh, to kind of models? Thank you. Thank you so much for great questions. So yes, I'm. I think that I, my methodology is more is a really emerging re my research. So maybe I need to more develop about the, my methodology, more focusing on the interviewing of the global of fans, fandoms, and then like the Korean K-pop, like uh, idols and the K Korean young girls who really um, enjoying in the K-pop cultures. So uh, last time, the, the three months ago, I visited in the Denver Art Museum in Denver, Colorado to about the, uh, participate in the K-pop concert, like a K-pop, like, um, some workshop. So I uh, pre I trying to do preliminary interview with the, some of the uh, young girls who are really uh, fascinated in the K-pop cultures about asking about the, their body images uh, related to the K-pop girls. And finally, I also find out found out about the, they really very. Uh, connected with the K-pop idols, female female idols body images, even though they are not uh, Korean, Korean, but they are all like a white and Hispanic and the black black like a uh, young girls. So maybe I will more engaging and interviewing with them about the, how can to understand their uh, body images relate to the K-pop girls. And then maybe I will more move forward the spirituality as well. Thank you. Remigius, you have a question? Yes. Um, 
both speakers, uh, th this question is directed to both speakers because I, I have asked this question, but I, I didn't get any answer. Um, I, I guess I'm still searching and it is something that, that goes this way. Um, is identity something fundamental and permanent or something or a multitude of social constructs? I am asking this question, honestly, um, believing that um, identity might be much more fundamental and permanent than the multitude of social constructs that continue to evolve. So any of us, anybody could could chime in and, and see if this can be resolved for me, because I, I believe that essentially the spirituality we are talking about, uh, spirituality seems to be very ontological. Here is, uh, if, if it is going to be valuable in the face of ever involving social construction, then that the, the attention of spirituality will be on that fundamental unchangeable core. Mm. I don't know, just a thought. Uh, <clears throat> for me, uh, thank you for asking about the ontological fundamental understanding of the spirituality in religious education and formation. So for me, um, I'm a Korean and I'm now I'm studying in the United States and as a, through the transnational experience, uh, embodied experience, I have a little bit changed my spirituality understanding and then understanding my society and so societal construction and lived experience. So it is a, one of the example is that even though uh, when I live in the Korean, I am really privileged as a Korean because of Korean, I'm a Korean and then I'm very uh, privileged to live and in the Korea. However, when I st start to the study in the United States, I became a, a little bit in, the, in between experience and the marginalized in the society as a international students and then Asian and women. So that experience enables me to uh, move forward, understanding my spirituality and my relationship with God. So it is a, one, of the, one of the simple example of understanding the social construction and ontological identity formation and spirituality. Maybe Dr. Robinson, do you want to add something? Thank you so much for what you shared, Yunjin. Um, I think that was definitely a really good answer and start um, to answering the question that's on the table. When I think about identity, um, I think about it in terms of formation, in an ongoing formation. Um, I don't know that we're necessarily born with an identity. Um, I also recognize that there are um, <clears throat> social contracts that can, social constructs that can inform identity formation. Um, so uh, to answer your question, I don't know that it's an either or. Um, I think identity is formed by many influences, like a confluence of influences. Um, so um, when I think about identity, I do think it is, it can be within a group, it can be individualistic. Um, however, it is one that is always in formation, um, whether that's a malformation or a, a constructive formation. Um, but I don't think it's stoic. I think it's always in some way being shaped um, by whichever influence is actually having an impact on the being of that human. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for this engaging conversation. Um, let's move on to our next uh, presenter. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Paulos Eco Cristianto. 
is a doctoral uh, student of religious education at Duta Wakana Christian University um, in Indonesia. And besides that, he is also um, a religious education teacher at Pelanji Kasi uh, School in Jakarta, uh, Indonesia. So, Paulos, we look forward to hearing um, your presentation. Okay, thank you. Good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, I will share screen. Okay. Not, not yet. Okay. Uh, I will present my paper, uh, Religious Education in Encountering Child's Marriage. When I uh, start in this moment, I think that uh, we understand that child marriage is one of the context of the world, especially. Uh, when we talk about child marriage, it's also done at the age of 18, but if under 18, we call uh, child marriage. And child marriage still uh, have a problem, especially because uh, this marriage happened in the transitional stage of sexual reproduction and marriage itself. Uh, child marriage is also bring a problem uh, for women or men because they have a problem of education, healthy, uh, economic, domestic violence, violence against children, mental health, child identity, wrong parenting style to their children. Especially, they more happen from a uh, women perspective. Child marriage happen occurs in various places not only from Indonesia, but also we can see, uh, for example, East Asia, Pacific Europe, Central Asia, Latin America, Caribbean, Middle East, North Africa, South Asia, Sub-Sahara, Africa. And when we see the report from UNICEF that show estimate one, uh, 140 million girls will marry early in the next decade or nearly uh, 40,000 per uh, day. So yes, uh, big, they are a big uh, number. When we talk about our religious education, I'm using the definition from Jack Seymour. Jack Seymour uh, stated about Christian education and I think that is correlates with religious education. Uh, Christian education is a conversation for living, a seeking to use the resources of the faith and cultural tradition to move into an open future of justice and hope. Uh, based on the, uh, this definition, I think that religious education is expected to contribute to preventing and overcoming child marriage from a curative perspective not only it, but also from prevention. Prevention means that religious education build awareness for children, adolescents, youth, and adults to reject child marriage to save the, the lives and hope of the children. And the curative perspective, this means that children who have entered and experienced child marriage are guided by adults and are wise to enter to the world marriage and family. This is done in order to minimize the various negative impact of child marriage, uh, like uh, some problem that I already stated before. Uh, Mary Elizabeth Moore uh, show us about teaching narratively, and I will use it as a methodology in this paper. The discussion build uh, narrative methods or, or teaching narratively calls for image of storytelling, simulation, gaming, 
dramatization and ritual reenactment. Uh, using uh, the theory from Mary Elizabeth Moore, I I look that Moore uh, show five theoretical reflection. First, imagination is being revalued as an important ingredient in education. Second, narrative are an important sources of imagination. Third, narrative is a source of human consciousness and social critics. Fourth, story is a form of indirect communication that conveys to that cannot be communicated directly. Fifth, stories have the power to inform that transform the world. So by using the methodology from Mary Moore, I think that a narrative method can be constructed to describe the preventive and curative action to encounter child marriage. Uh, meanwhile, the narrative uh, not only used from Bible, but also we can use uh, outside the Bible like experience. Child marriage is also a phenomenon that so we need to reject and oppose because it destroys the lives and hope of the children. Of course, the rejection is a carried out uh, jointly by children, adults, supported by children, their self, parent, family, faith community, and uh, society. How narrative method work in encountering child marriage? I propose two narrative about it for the first experience of child marriage. Uh, women who experience child marriage are vulnerable to diseases. This vulnerable is common uh, when they are pregnant, uh, like the experience for in Bangladesh. There have been attempts to lower the number of child marriage that is proven to be harmful for the health of the mothers and child either through formal informal education as well as the revision of the law that set the age limit for the minimal age of 19 for marriage in the country. Uh, when we talk about it, indirectly, child marriage can be re related to child prostitution as an experience because it happened if child marriage is done for economic reasons. Poor parents propose their children be married off to improve their family economy. They know that children, their children are not worthy of marriage. In such cases, the girls are constantly seen as a burden to their families or are exchanged in a financial transaction to relieve their economic struggle to praise, price, bread well, or dowry. Uh, not only it, but uh, in situation of war, to save girls, adult men often use this as an excuse for child marriage. Uh, there is a research from Masuarana, Marshak Spears. In Indonesia and Bangladesh, it is in light with child marriage is often seen as a way out for the bad stigma that afflict a girl to a sexual experience outside of wedlock, victim of rape, and various other forms of sexual abuse. The practice of child married places the young priests under the control of her spouse in law, severely limiting her ability to voice her opinion so they can be silent, cannot express about their situation. Exclusion from participation and this is making regardless uh, issue in one's own life and those addressing a household, family, or community is directly linked to the lack of voice and again see. Uh, the second narrative that I propose is marriage is for mature people. Uh, mature is not same with adult. Adult only saw the length of life in the world, but maturity shows one's maturity when dealing with the various things. Indicator of maturity in marriage are economic independence, sexual awareness, bodily development, 
and the mastery of talks uh, based on the research from Sarfo, Yendok, and Naido. Uh, Indicator of maturity in marriage are early childhood experience, first sexual encounters, and pregnancy and parenthood. It can be shown uh, outside uh, the viewer uh, research, but works tell about uh, how the parent protect your early uh, childhood baby. Your childhood experience show how people remember their childhood with their parents and became uh, their profession in education uh, their children. Uh, not only it, but also we talk about a uh, child marriage and needed uh, uh, maturity is also connected with first sexual encounters because it show how couples who previously never had sexual intercourse now enter the process of procreation. Not all couples experience this smoothly. And there are times when partners feel afraid because of wrong imagination or experiences in the past, especially for them as a victim of rape and violence. Pregnancy and parenthood are not as an easy of one might imagine, especially for couples who decide to go child-free with various uh, economic, mental, career, and environmental consideration. Uh, how about from a Christian worldview? Christian worldview tell us that marriage is indeed an initiative of God. God created Eve as a watchful helper for Adam and led to marriage. Of course, this initiative is carried, carried out uh, with the understanding that everything must be done maturely. Mature here refers to mature people's experience in responding to God's wills and considering all the experiences around them so that humans can become better in the process according to what God wants. Two narrative, uh, I bring into narrative above uh, into religious education uh, using narrative method in encountering child merit. Uh, I use two aspects, uh, preventive and curative. In principle, religious education using narrative method is encountering child merit talk about preventive and curative. Preventive means that child marriage does not occur for various reasons that make it possible. Curative uh, talk about how child marriage is unstoppable and has already happened with causes various subsequent problems in life after marriage. Uh, preventive and curative are carried out in collaboration with various parties namely the children to self, parents, family, faith, community, and society. How it works, we can see. From per preventive perspective, children need to understand the true narrative of the child merit as described in the previous, uh, previous section. The experience of child marriage makes them see that child marriage harms them. Understanding marriage is only for mature people make children dare to realize their existence, that they are, they are immature and not worthy to enter into marriage. The rule of parents who have been educated about the lucid understanding of child, child marriage is expected to help children dare to decide to refuse child marriage to save uh, the existence of children themselves and their maturity before entering a marriage. How about families? Family educated parents and children who want to decide child marriage on their children and parents can experience bad things after their children get married because of their children's mental unpreparedness. How about faith community? I think that faith community roles is to educate parents and children on preventing child marriage to various religious education practice, for example, uh, Sunday school, Bible study, cell community, family worship, regional worship, Sunday worship. How about society? 
I think that society is also uh, encouraged to present various facts and experience of child marriage that are not prosperous for the children and their family after they break up uh, child marriage. This is from a preventive perspective. Now we go on to curative perspective. Children need to learn about married life, even though it seems sudden because they are already trapped and have entered into married lives. This lesson, this lesson can involve the narrative as described in the previous uh, section. The most important thing that children who have entered into a child marriage need to know is how they learn to become mature in marriage. The role of parents are to help children mature when facing all the problems that occur in marriage. It can be started from with occasional parents still helping with their needs, but slowly the parents make their children independent and facing the reality of child marriage. How about families? Family play a role in providing support uh, for children trapped in child marriage so they can slowly progress to maturity. How about faith community? I think that faith community provide faith support and resilience in undergoing a child married towards major marriage with uh, various means and practice of religious education. How about society? Society provides social support to child children who fall into child marriage by not uh, gossiping about them, but by enabling the children to become major in marriage. Now I go on to propaganda, religious education using narrative method uh, in countering child merit. Uh, in propaganda, I propose a trick question. It can be helped to, in, uh, to propaganda religious education. For the first, what does marriage mean to you? Is this marriage God's will or not? This question is un un undoubtedly preventive and curative at the same time. Prevention talk about how they can think about it before deciding to marry. Curative talk about how they seek God's will even though they are now in the stage of child marriage. In principle, this question is meaningful. The meaning of help is of helping anyone prepare for marriage wisely, both preventive and curatively. The meaning encourages anyone to take an attitude or action on particular issue. And the second question that I propose is how to feel a marriage according to God's will. The question is certainly more towards the curative side, although it can be prepared for prevention. The curative side highlight, highlighted here refers to how the children hold on to and seek God's will amid the social disasters they experience. Carlos, God we will. have about one more minute. Um, can you oh. uh, wrap up so we can move on to the um, uh, okay. engagement with the audience? Thank you so much. Yeah, okay. And the third uh, question is, can this marriage still be a blessing for the children, their parents, their, their families, the faith community and society? Uh, he, in my paper, I also designing a religious education using narrative method in encountering child merit in the practice of religious education. I give examples from uh, Sunday school, uh, Bible narrative, in bubble studies, the cell community, nuclear or extended family, and several various families uh, also do regional worship, Sunday worship. And my conclusion in this paper is child marriage is a real problem that must be faced prevalently and creatively. Uh, the full presentation uh, you can see in my paper. Thank you. Thank you so much for your important research um, on this topic. Um, uh, any questions from the audience or uh, um, ways that you'd like to engage with Paulos?
Yeah, Carlos, yes. congratulations. At, at uh, your... Sorry, uh, John, John, you raised your hand. Yeah, well, uh, Ramijus can go first. That's all right. Sorry, uh, John, I, I didn't uh, look closely. I, I was I was congratulating Carlos for his paper, and um, I I thank him sincerely for bringing up something that is uh, a real issue in in several parts of the world, including Africa, where I come from. I am, I am, uh, my question is, uh, children are children, and they are children for a reason. I think they are children for the reason that they cannot make decisions. So child marriage remains an adult affair. And uh, it is not at all place to consider it child abuse to tolerate child marriage. So my, my question is, uh, do we as communities of faith have any leverage over the parents of these children to discourage child marriage uh, for the various reasons you gave? Uh, there are health reasons, there is inexperience, there is perpetuation of poverty as a result of child marriage and so on. Do, do, do faith communities have any leverage over the parents mm -hmm. of, of these children? Thank you. Okay, thank you for your question, Remy. I think that uh, this uh, this issue, maybe children cannot deal itself uh, easily because a social construct of a culture maybe uh, can press uh, or make children cannot tell or show their argument or avoid to child marriage. So we need a society started from family, uh, faith communities and society itself to help children to show their argument to avoid child marriage. So children can be uh, rejected. Children can be empowered to make a decision what it can make uh, their happy or sad. If we, it can be happen in, in, their, uh, in their lives, child marriage cannot be happen. And as we know that child marriage happened not only in Asia, but also in many places in the world. Uh, when I do the research, uh, I read some article journal that I write, write on in my paper, uh, page one until uh, page five, that show that many kind of narratives of child marriage happen in the world and have same uh, argument that children still uh, cannot say their position clearly because of social construct. So we must help your children. And as well as children, if, uh, if have a brief to reject it, uh, the social not deal or not uh, help them. So the children can be uh, small, and can be uh, the victim. So we must help them because as we know that children still have a power and their voice can be uh, embraced or can be make a power to change the society, change uh, their lives and extra. Uh, I remind a book of children theology on a paper from uh, and a book from uh, Compton is also how children's voice can be make a big changes in society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are uh, we have one more presentation. Um, John, would you be able to put your question in the chat? Um, we're running short sure. on time. Thank Absolutely. you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to move on to our last but not least uh, presentation, um, which is uh, presented by um, by by two um, two scholars, um, Justicia uh, Vox de Hatu, who teaches Christian education at Jakarta Theological Seminary and serves as a pastor of the Protestant Church of Malukas, and Magyolin Carolina um, Tuasun 
who is also a pastor. Um, she serves the community of Pasundan Christian Church. Currently, she is doing her doctoral uh, work at Jakarta Theological Seminary. Thank you so much for, um, for your scholarship. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. Okay, thank you, uh, Reverend Patricia, and good uh, morning for all of us. Good evening from uh, Jakarta. I, uh, Justicia Fox de Hatu, together with uh, one of our students, Magiolin Carolina Tuasun, we are going to present uh, our paper. Uh, let me. The title for our presentation is uh, Theologizing with Children Who Are Victims of Religious Radicalism, a story from Indonesian uh, context. Radicalism in the name of uh, religion is still happening in Indonesia until now, and various acts of radicalism in the name of uh, religion have had several impact on people's life, uh, particularly children. In this kind of situation, we found that uh, children ask for the presence and justice of God. They become easily suspicious of friends of different religions and also background. And some of them get angry, even hold grudge uh, against the perpetrators and wish that the bad things to happen to the perpetrators of the violence. While we found also that some other children accept uh, violence as what they deserve as a Christian. And this thing happened because there are different uh, interpretation that growing up among the children that they got from the parents, uh, from the some texts from the Bible, such as uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse uh, 22, and Luke uh, chapter 6, uh, verse 27. One of the children community that uh, experience a significant impact from this act of radicalism what the children uh, at the Pasundan Christian Church of Diakolot in the West Java, which is uh, located in the western part of Indonesia. In 2005, act of intimidation began to be carried out by a group of people. Intimidation accompanied by threats of carrying sharp weapon did not receive enough attention from the local security force. So the priest serving at uh, the Pasundan uh, Christian Church of Diakolot at that time had to be evacuated together with all the ch church member. And in 2008, threats were made again, and this time accompanied by act of vandalism. The act of violence not only damaged the church building, and the ornament in it, but also made the church member be teased, beaten, and verbally abused. This act of violence has an impact on development of children who so felt and experienced uh, the, the, tra the tragedy directly. Children who had to see, hear, and witness act of intolerance, act of violence due to religious difference. They heard how they were called name as if they were animals. Pots were broken and houses were thrown with stone and even firecrackers. Since then, they have held service far from where they live, namely at rural chapel owned by Emmanuel Bandung Hospital, which is located quite far away from their places. And until now, they still getting a lot of intimidation from the society surrounding. So the next we are going to listen from the story of three children that are uh, interviewed by us. Story of R. R was about nine years old at the time of the incident. Many times he said that he could not forget the incident at the time. He explained, how could I forget it? That morning I was ready to attend Sunday school activities but when they entered the church, there were already many people carrying sharp weapons and clubs such as bamboo, wood, and other things. The word they, they were said very harsh. They called Christians infidel and animal name while driving us away. Even though our said that he forgave them, the perpetrators 
He honestly said, I pray that God will repay their evil deeds. When one of the repetitors gets sick and someone dies, I believe that it is form of God's revenge and grateful for that. I do not know if I am wrong or not, but that is how I feel. Story of Fee Fee, who is older than R at the time, expressed his view on the perpetrators. They are crazy. Why they are angry with us? What did we do to make them make like that? What is the point in destroying churches and church items? If it because of the different religions, it is weird. Since childhood, I have been fostered to religious differences, both in the family and friendship, at the school and at home. Parents have reminded to respect the differences. So even though their actions were like that, I forgive them. He believes that if there are bad people's actions against Christian, it is a part that must be accepted. God himself teaches us to accept those bad deeds. So Christian must carry the cross, my mother said. Does I think we are supposed to be in uncomfortable situation as often as it can be, so we get used to how people treat us badly. One of the Bible text cited by V is Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. V emphasized that being a follower of Jesus is not being happy, not accepting privileges, but having to carry the cross. When I was confirming my faith and then baptized, I already knew the consequences of following Jesus, namely carrying the cross. So I'm not surprised when I and the church experience challenge like this, act of intolerance. Story of S. S about 12 years old, explained when he, when he found out that the aunt who was sitting behind him was hit in the back when they ran away from the situation. I feel confused, sad, angry with their screams. When my mother and my aunt and I ran to the motorbike to go home immediately, I really did not expect them to catch up and someone hit my aunt's back with a piece of wood. Even though he, even though the anger was so great, as admit that the teaching of his parents made him accept and forgive the perpetrators. My parents and my Sunday school teacher always teach me that God wants us to love and to forgive. It means we must let it go, let every feeling of hatred towards the perpetrators. Based on the story above, it shows us that first, violence and acts of radicalism are realities faced by children. Second, violence and radicalism have a significant impact on children. On one hand, the child retains tremendous pain from the experience which is still carried over to this day. On the other hand, children are forced to accept this reality without having adequate space to manage all these feelings. As a result, forgiveness and submission to accept that that situation become an instant way out simply because we are Christian and only because the Bible has said such thing that we must obey. Statements made by parents and that we must accept the situation and condition, etc. are an indoctrination process that ignore other dimensions in life. Third, in this difficult situation, there is one important element that is forgotten by adults, namely making meaning. If these bad experiences are not processed, told or reflected on, 
then they will have a significant impact on children's lives. Four, the children must accept this reality without opening educate space to reflect on it. The theological process is considered as the property of adults only. So from the context, we're coming up with the issue of uh, theologizing with children in the context of religious radicalism. We see that in this situation, the church as the community of faith cannot be remain silent. The church need to take various action that can help children to get out of this multifaceted situation. One of the ways is by providing an open space for children to raise their voices and to do theology from their context and experience. For us, theologizing with children is one of the significant ways because of the tendency of churches in Indonesia until now to make children as an object in this kind of situation, even though in this problematic situation, Children are also asked several theological questions that require a quick response from adult. We argue that by providing a space for children to tell their story, raise their unheard voices, and reflect on their experience, we invite children to do theology as well as we did for adults. So based on our arguments, we, we base uh, our proposal on the three different theory. The first one is uh, Tanya Kempen in her book entitled Holy Work with Children, Making Meaning Together. She states that giving full attention to and listen to children opens space for faith community to experience firsthand and claim that God is with us because we allow space for God to speak through children and we allow ourselves to learn from children. Kempen's statement wants to emphasize that children are valuable as adult or other members of community, so they do not need to receive different treatment which tend to be discriminated. The second one is based on Joyce Mercer taught in her book, Welcoming Children. She emphasized that doing theology with children must be done by following the footsteps of Jesus in the past which shows significantly how God's work in the life of children, choosing children as partners in carrying out works of service and theology, as well as carrying out social transformation for children and for all of us. For Mesa, small doesn't mean unimportant or even less valuable. Conversely, small is a good place to start the theological process. And the third one is a David Sinos, he stated that children not only learn theology, but they also actively and creatively create theology and bring together various aspects of their life or experience to shape their theological understanding. Based on this three theory, we understood that uh, children on this kind of situation, religious radicalism, they should be a uh, subject uh, for the way they are reflecting on what they experience. In this sense, uh, we agree with what uh, Sino says that children are little theologian. And the second one we understand learning from three theory that uh, theologizing should be understood as a making meaning process. So one among many best way to do theology with children is by, in, by involving children in the process of making meaning. As a theologian, children's voice need to be heard by members of the community. Doing, doing theology with children means creating a space for children to tell the defined story that they have that describe their life or journey of faith with God and neighbors until they arrive at concrete response to the various reflection that they do. The space create allow children to wonder various things. This questioning process help children to shape their theological understanding. Therefore, the children's strong desire to ask questions should be responded positively by adult. 
and not silenced by adults on the ground that children are still too young to ask questions like that or it is not time for them to know the things that usually be claimed as adult business. We also learn from uh, Kempen and uh, with her four important stages in the many making process, namely engage, recognize, claim and response. And for us, these four stages which are proposed by Kempen can be used as a way of doing theology with children, particularly those who are victims of radicalism. Even though we understood well that it should be also read from the perspective perspective of Indonesian children. The first one is engage. It refers to the process when children are invited to connect with God and others in the learning process. The state is marked by the willingness of children to open their heart and mind to what is being discussed or experienced, including showing their interest, concern, and curiosity. And it shows well in the story of fee. The second one is recognize. It refers to the ability of children to identify the presence of God and others in various events of their life. For example, God is with me when I'm afraid, God is with me when I'm lost and alone, and etc. The third one is claim. This stage it refers to how children remember and express the presence of God in their life. At this stage, the child will remember how, when, and where the experience of God and all the experience began to be spoken in the religious language of the children. And the fourth one is respond. In this process, children are invited to respond to the various experience they have experienced. So finally, for us, by involving children in the process of making meaning as suggested by Kempen, following four stages proposed by her, we open enough space for children and place them as subject in the process of doing theology. That's all from us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for raising uh, this important uh, work on religious radicalism and violence against children. Um, any questions, comments, points of connection um, that you would like to raise uh, to our presenters or engage our presenters? Any comments? Yes, Mary. Um, I'm curious, this is such a, a beautiful and concise presentation that you've made. And I noticed that you drew on a lot of US religious educators. And I'm curious to what extent um, that work has resonated with you or are there things you want to push back against because I know the context you're working in is so very different in some ways yeah yeah uh, do I have to respond Mary yeah okay yeah we realize also what uh, you stated uh, before that uh, the three of the theory that we using in this presentation uh, came from the Western perspective or context. And that's why in my presentation before I mentioned that uh, one thing that missing in our paper is we have to read it again from the perspective of Indonesian, particularly from the children's uh, perspective. Is it uh, because when we go through, went through the four important stages that mentioned by Kempen, actually when the radicalism, religious radicalism happened, uh, it's not an easy as uh, Kempen mentioned, uh, children may experience um, maybe two or three uh, stages 
instead of uh, following the the, uh, the four stages that she proposed. But uh, we realized also that uh, Kempen gave us the framework to help us to construct how to uh, making meaning with the children who are victim of the religious radicalism. Yeah, thank you so much. We take note for that one. Thank you very much. Any any other questions, thoughts, comments? I'd like to then open up the space for us to have an open conversation with um, all of our presenters. Um, even if our uh, if there's questions among the presenters that you'd like to have um, that you'd like to engage with each other on these issues, I'm just struck by um, the 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 theme of identity that has come up um, just across the presentations um, and and how we work with um, children and their identity um, in religious education, um, be it young girls in an, uh, black girls in an Oreo world. Um, Asian women who are stereotyped because of K-pop, um, children who have been victims of, of violence through um, uh, radicalization of, of religion, um, and, and women and young girls who, who, who have to, you know, change their identity, uh, step into identities, impose identities as wives and mothers um, in child marriage, just um, very, very uh, important work that you all are doing, and I'm just so grateful that you're um, presenting with us here and and having a letting us have an opportunity to engage your work and there's a very active uh, uh, conversation in the chat as well any 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 thoughts any questions any way you would like to engage each other? Yes, Paulus. Okay, I will start from uh, Gina uh, presentation last time. The uh, I think same read that I write in chat box. Uh, Gina presentation remind me with the film Freedom Writers and it promotes us uh, the colonial uh, the colonial religious education, but I will uh, embrace it and collaborate it with how the colonial religious education can be happen in uh, Gina Robinson's context. Thanks for that question. Um, and I think that is definitely part of the question that I am um, constantly pursuing. Like how can we decolonize even the ways in which religious education and Christian education has been um, traditionally or historically implemented in some of the spaces in which I've had the opportunity to work in. Like I've made some changes myself um, as far as the ways that I may talk about a text or the ways I construct, construct sermons. Um, usually they're more so like conversations and less like me talking at people um, or the way in which I would treat pre preach in a traditional way in an adult sanctuary. Um, so that is one way that I am, and I don't even know if that's necessarily decolonial. I think that um, that step to share messages and have conversations with um, young people is a way to humanize them and help them to know there is some sort of faith at work there, you know, whether you're recognizing it or not. Uh, so let's talk about it. It doesn't have to be the same faith that your parents have. Um, but if you feel like you believe, then there's a start. And we can talk about that and see where you are and see where you would like to be and grow in your faith formation, opposed to me dictating to them, these are things you ought to believe. No, this is what it means to be a Christian and this is how. Thank you, Gina. Uh, and the second question, maybe, can you recommend us uh, a book of decolonized? 
religious education from your perspective or your context, maybe? I'm trying to think um, of books, titles in this moment um, that I could recommend. I don't know that it would have decolonial in the title or even in uh, naming their work as decolonial, but there are people who are doing that sort of work regardless. If I can type it in the chat, I just need to go to like Amazon and Google. Um, I know author name, but book is escaping me. So I'll put one, at least one in the chat that may be helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Any any thoughts from um, the participants? Any any um, comments, uh, points of connection with your own uh, ministry or work that you'd like to um, lift up? Yes, Remy. Uh, thank you for giving me the chance again. Um, I think the work all these our scholars have done are indicative of the continuous job each and every one of us need to do uh, decolonizing the mind. Um, the the co de new colonizing is ongoing. And I think this conference has demonstrated for me that um, uh, the work of emancipation is not over for especially a good, um, a larger percentage of the world, uh, whether it's in the United States or in Europe, uh, Asia. So it's so systemic that um, uh, for religious educators and religious education practitioners, we need to be at a point of acceptance and see our work uh, uh, to be a summons to uh, Jesus's work, um, light to the Gentiles, um, make the limb work, uh, bring glad tidings to the poor, set prisoners free, and on and on and on. When we see ourselves in that, um, in in that in that light, I think we there, there is uh, the sky is the limit to uh, what we can achieve. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, and I just want to direct folks to the um, the chat um, where resources are being shared. Um, please take note of those. Um, just very very important uh, resources and and work here. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Okay, I don't want to keep us longer than um, than our conversation um, has has uh, taken us. Um, but I would like to um, divert to Mary if you have any um, any announcements or anything you'd like to share about uh, the rest of the conference. We've got just a few more sessions to go. Yeah, I want to note a couple of things. One is I put um, the feedback form for this session in the chat. And please remember that speakers get to read that. And so if there's particular things or questions you want to keep working on, you could put them there. Um, there's a reflection session later this afternoon, uh, US time. So I, um, you figure out what the time is for you. Um, that's kind of a closing thing for the meeting. And then I also want to note that we're doing our level best to get recordings up as quickly as we can. We have to edit out some, you know, beginnings and ending stuff and put names in and that kind of stuff. But you'll be able to find the recordings of sessions on the schedule. When they're there, there's a little button in each session. Um, so anyway, thank you for all of that. Um, and yeah, thanks for these wonderful presentations. Thank you. Can can we all say uh, um, um, offer our thanks to our presenters? Uh, wonderful work. Thank you, everyone. Blessings. Um, I hope everybody so for the next meeting. Take care. Thank you, everyone.